assume, arrogate. Presumption is a key element of the meaning, the literal meaning of the word summons. So in 3264, a summons is usually issued in matters before a competent court to compel by presumption someone to attend in the presumed capacity of defendant, juror or witness. A summons, as is arrest warrant, is a, a document full of presumptions. Now, if you go and have a look at the older versions of arrest warrants and summonses prior to the 20th century, even in fact prior to the 19th century, you would be hard pressed to find any language associated with threat or, or force. Yes, it was clear, but certainly there was no language on these in terms of threatening someone, that if you don't go, we'll put you in prison, we'll tear out your fingernails, we'll torture you. Well, in the present system, they have become so arrogant and so ignorant of their own foundations that even if you get a parking fine, which is a form of summons, and you read it, the language is outrageous in threat. Well, it is still all based on presumption. And the key presumption is that you do not rebut it. That is what they don't want you to do. They do not want you to be rebutted because then when you come to court, which is what they assume you do, you come with all those presumptions standing. So in 3267, as a true person, and all of you are true persons, as you cater, and this is where Eucadia fits into the bigger picture. Eucadia is about providing the structure so that together we can live in a better framework and not simply be individuals. It's providing a structure and a foundation. As a true person is both an executive and beneficiary of their mind, body and soul, no party may rightfully claim higher authority to compel them to attend any forum or event against their will. Providing such false presumptions are rebutted prior to the day in time listed on the summons, the instrument and its presumptions cease to have any effect whatsoever, which is why we want to get back to the presumptions. Okay, well, thank you for letting me go and segue on summons. I'm now going to return back to Roman Court, Article 299, to continue. And we were up to talking about summons. So sorry to jump around, but we're going back to Article 299 of Positive Law on one-heaven.org. And we were going through in Canon 3228 the list of 12 presumptions. So let's go back and reread the fifth presumption. The presumption of summons is that by custom a summons unrebutted stands and therefore one who attends court is presumed to accept a position, defendant, juror, witness, and jurisdiction of the court. All the presumptions built in. So attendance to court is usually invitation by summons, and unless it's rejected and returned with a copy of the rejection filed prior to choosing to visit or attend, jurisdiction and position of the accused and the existence of guilt stands. Okay. Let's now move to the sixth presumption. The presumption of custody. Now, this is an important one, particularly when people uh, are placed under arrest. And we'll talk about custody in a moment as well, because custody is another key area of presumption that is much maligned in being made uh, clear enough to people. Now, the presumption of custody is that by custom, a summons or warrant for arrest unrebutted stands and therefore one who attends court is presumed to be a thing. You become a thing. A person is in, in one sense a thing and therefore liable to be tamed in custody by custodians. Now custodians can only lawfully hold custody of property and things, not flesh and blood souls possessing beings. Uh, soul-possessing beings. You cannot be arrested as a man or a woman. You can't arrest a man as a woman. 
If a man or a woman is detained, that is not custody, that is kidnapping. Custody and the very meaning of the word from custodian is one who keeps things and property. Now, in the ancient world, of course, slaves were considered property. So they had no problems mentally in the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, in considering men and women as property. But here's the key distinction. They are presuming you will accept being regarded as property. This is the difference between common law of the Roman Venetians, of the English and the Venetians, and feudal law of the Khazar Magyar Venetians and the Roman cult. They switched it from mandatory to voluntary. The difference is the presumption. Now, if you accept being a thing, they can hold custody over you. When you know who and what you are, and you know that you are general guardian of your own flesh, general executor of your own mind and body and spirit, they have no jurisdiction over you whatsoever. So custody is an important one. So unless the presumption is openly challenged by rejection of the summons and or court, the presumption stands you're a thing in property and therefore lawfully able to be kept in custody by custodians. Okay. Number seven of the presumptions. The presumption of court of guardians. The presumption of court of guardians is the presumption that as you may be listed as a resident of a ward of a local government area and have listed on your passport letter P, you're a pauper and therefore under the guardian powers of the government and its agents as a court of guardians. Now what do we mean by this? I'm sorry but I need to go another little sidetrack now and I need to ask you if you can please to go and have a look at Article 307, which is still work in progress, but 307 when we talk about hearing. And I just want to mention some background in terms of the history of guardianship, a role that parallels the role of executor, but one that we haven't really, I feel, in the past adequately identified. Now, for all the excitement that has come through in understanding what we mean by executor, we still see that the role of the guardian is not well understood. And so I'm hoping that we can make this clearer in what we're doing. And I'm just getting it up now. Okay. So Canon 3269, and then I'll explain why we've come here. Canon 3269, a hearing of, this is of positive law, uh, of uh, one half in heaven. A hearing is an administrative proceeding by one or more authorised guardians concerning the acts of certain wards under their control. That is the formal definition of a hearing. Not what you'll find in Blacks, not what you'll find on Wikipedia. That is the true meaning of a hearing. A hearing is an administrative proceeding by one or more authorised guardians concerning the acts of certain wards under their control. And the most form common form of hearing is a court hearing by magistrates, otherwise known as summary judgments, uh, and presumed guardians over residents and citizens. And what they mean by residents and citizens is presumed wards and paupers. Now, I won't get into the... Well, we'll get into the definition of hearing. The, the word hearing comes from the word here, 17th century word combining two ancient Latin phrases, being here, pronounced here, meaning come on, come now, and here, or heres, pronounced here, meaning heir, heiress and successor. Now, the concept of guardian and pauper coincide with the creation of the concept of settlements in the late... 16th and 17th century. You might like to know that the Bank of Banks, the highest financial institution created by our friends, the Venetians, the Magyar, the Sabatines and their Roman cult, 
is the bank for international settlements. There's no accident that the most powerful bank in the world, in Basel in Switzerland, is called the Bank for International Settlements. So when they created the concept of guardian, they created the concept of pauper. They stopped calling us serfs, being less than animals, and started calling us paupers. That was common law rights. Thanks very much. And what they did in the 16th century, 17th century was they introduced the concept, the obligation of charity to distinguish one system of slavery from another. So Venetian English common law slavery from absolute Venetian Roman feudal law barbarism. So people were no longer considered animals, but poor or paupers, while the Lord and the church were no longer able to kill, rape and murder with impunity, but were obliged to provide arms and sustenance to the poor of their parish. And under such a model, when one admitted to being a pauper, a single administrative official assumed the role of clerk of guardians and could presume to render summary judgment without the requirement of a tribunal or magistrate. Now, are we paupers? Does the system view us as paupers? Okay. Well, paupers were required before they made the system ubiquitous, were required to wear peas, similar to the peas you see on uh, the old prison uniforms. And prior to that, it was the vagrants that had to wear a, a, a symbol. So paupers were required to identify themselves as paupers and so that they could be handled appropriately. And paupers were given certain limited rights, but always under the control of the guardians. Now, if you are identified officially on official documents as a pauper, then under the magistrate's court and the modern versions of the hearings, absolutely, the clerk of the guardians, appointed by the guardians, can render summary judgments without even saying, hello, how are you? Are you a pauper? Well, I pull, I pull out my passport and I read the words here on it and this is what it says. It says, The Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, being the representative in Australia of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, requests all those whom it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and to afford him or her every assistance and protection of which he or she may stand in need. Does that sound like an opening statement of identifying a pauper? Of course it does. Go and have a look at your passport. And if you want to make sure that the P is still being used to identify the pauper, I look at my own passport, I look at type, and it says P. They assume me, they presume me to be a pauper. Now the second one, and we'll move back to the presumptions in a moment, is the concept of guardian and ward. And this is this, this word resident that comes up. The concept of guardian and ward as a resident of a hospital for lunatics and the insane is derived from the late 19th century. And this is where this international law comes from in the creating of hospitals under the Geneva Convention, creating of local government areas. Uh, and under this model, a second form of hearing emerged as a quasi-medical examination administered by the clerk of guardians assisted by the magistrate to determine whether the accused had a case to answer to a high court or not, or needed a psych evaluation, or was mentally incapable of standing trial. So when you go through the funnel of the lower courts, these are the two roles that they're dealing with. The presumption of you being either a resident, being effectively an outpatient of a hospital, someone who is a lunatic, or someone who's a pauper. That's all I give you. And this is now international law. And this is why the United Nations now is the government, the one government and this whole system